This program was made possible by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. Again, we welcome you to another session of our roundtable discussions on the New Testament. We're discussing in the Four Gospels the last week of the Savior's ministry. With me today are members of the Ancient Scripture Department at Brigham Young University. To my far left is Keith Wilson. Next, Paul Hoskison, Ray Huntington, and I'm Camille Frank. We are looking at final event recorded in Scripture for the day of Tuesday, um, the same day of the, his last public discourse up on the, on the Temple Mount. Um, as he ended weeping over the city of Jerusalem, um, that he, how he would like to have gathered them as a mother hen gathereth her chickens under her, her wings, but ye would not. Um, calling them to repentance, a, a voice of warning. And then later that same day, he goes to the Mount of Olives with his apostles, right? And they have a, a different sermon, quite a different one, where he answers questions and teaches them based on some events and teachings that he's had earlier. We have Matthew 24 in the Gospels that is um, a great treatise of that, but it pales in comparison to what Joseph Smith has given to us, a part of the Joseph Smith translation called Joseph Smith Matthew in the Pearl of Great Price. And so if we're all in agreement, let's just turn there to look at this great sermon. Now, uh, Camille, the, the title that we usually give this discourse that uh, maybe will just help for sake of nomenclature is the Olivet Discourse, coming from the Mount of Olives is what we tie it to. Let's Okay. And, and here... Uh, in Joseph Smith, Matthew, verse 1, as he teaches those apostles, um, we see that last sentence there I think is interesting, then understood his disciples that he should come again on the earth. As he has taught um, that second sentence in that verse, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord in the clouds of heaven and all the holy angels with him, as he's described this. I think it's an interesting thing that happens right there on that mount as, as they be, begin this sermon, is that perhaps for the first time his apostles are understanding he will come again, that he is not going to accomplish everything during that mortal ministry. Um, then they understood that he would come, come again. And they have then some questions for him, don't they? As he's made reference to destruction. Um, verse 4, the disciples ask, Two separate questions. Tell us when shall these things be which thou hast said concerning the destruction of the temple and the Jews? And what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world or the destruction of the wicked, which is the end of the world? You know, Camille, one of the things I, I think it must have, um, you know, Jesus has said a lot of things to his disciples and apostles that have uh, sort of shocked them mm -hmm. over, over, over the last uh, few years. And uh, I think he said something, something uh, earlier in the day when they were on the Temple Mount in, in which he referred to this, uh, um, to the Temple of Herod, which is a absolute, must have been an absolute beautiful structure, huge structure. And then had made the statement that there would not be one stone left upon another, uh, referring to that temple. In other words, he's talking about a total destruction. Of, of that uh, of that beautiful temple, and I, I think uh, that must have taken his his disciples back again, uh, and and they they're left wondering, what on earth is he talking right. about here in terms of uh, the destruction of the temple and also the Jews, and uh, and they want more information, and they want more information again in verse four uh, regarding uh, his second coming because they've understood now that he's he is going to return a second time. And they want and, more and don't you think it, in some ways they could be thinking the answer to both of those questions may be the same answer? In other words, that 
when the, the temple is going to be destroyed will be the same time he will return in, in great glory. We see a lot more with hindsight and, and seeing some of these events that have taken place. But this is where Joseph Smith Matthew is such a, a contribution to our understanding because there's considerably more verses in Joseph Smith Matthew than we have in Matthew 24. And the order of those verses has changed so that we can see very clearly that the Lord answers one question and then he answers the other one. That we can distinguish between signs that he's talking about that answer the first question, what about the destruction of the temple, which we now see as taking place in about A.D. 70, Mm -hmm. when Titus led in a Roman army and destroyed Jerusalem. And those events which have not yet taken place, that we still look to the future. Camille, as our chapter heading in Joseph Smith Matthew and the Pearl of Gate Price indicates, the uh, Joseph Smith Matthew text is the text of Joseph Smith translating the Bible. Any, any comments here amongst us about uh, why this particular chapter was actually uh, translated either both before or had kind of a special preeminence from the prophet's standpoint? He, he, you know, mm-hmm. The other chapters of the Bible don't show up in the same way uh, in our Pearl of Great Price like that. Uh, any, any feelings about that? Did, was this a topic that really uh, just drew the prophet Joseph Smith in? Was it his favorite uh, in the in the in the Bible, even though he doesn't ever leave us those footnotes, uh, I've wondered about that. Comments on that? Well, in those days, the the second coming of the Lord, the advent of the Lord, was a popular topic uh, uh, among uh, many groups, religious groups in the United States, and certainly it was a question which was asked among Latter Day Saints: When is the second coming? We have commentary in the church history of of. Uh, Joseph Smith himself actually asking that very question, when, when are you coming again? When is the second coming? And receiving that famous answer that if you live to a certain age, you'll see the coming. The Lord knowing fully well that Joseph wouldn't live to that D- age. D&C 130, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so this, the, the question of the second advent of the Lord it was uh, very much alive in, in Joseph Smith's day. And this must have, uh, the revelation here, the reception of of. Uh, the uh, translation of Matthew 24, as we have it now in the Pearl of Great Price, must have been really an answer to, uh, to a question in their minds about what's going on. And, and, and the, it's interesting, too, what's going on in Joseph Smith's life when he receives direction to translate this. If Remember, he started with the book of Genesis and doing the Joseph Smith translation, and he gets through, not even halfway through the book of Genesis, when he receives section 45 of, the, what we call section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord makes mention of this very discourse that he gave to his, to his disciples and then says, asks, directs Joseph to begin translating the New Testament where he will learn more. And we understand that the very next day from the he records, goes right to Matthew he goes 24. right, goes right to, it. to Matthew and begins the New Testament then, doesn't, completes the entire New Testament, doesn't he, before he goes back and goes finishes back the and Old finishes Testament. And then but, but it's for yeah. this very discourse, which... Um, at a time of perhaps persecution and challenges of the saints in Joseph Smith's day, this gives a message of hope and, and rec- recognizing that the Lord is in control. You know, one thing, too, is, um, I think is important, Camille, is uh, in many ways this, this chapter is not for the rank and file of the world. Well, it is in one sense. They have it. They can read it. But this is directed to members of the church. To Mem- the elect. Members of the church who hearken exactly. to the voice of the Lord, yeah. who keep covenants, who therefore will read and understand and be close to the Spirit yeah. to receive, understand so, the meaning yeah, when it comes. This has great application for us right. today. The, the majority of these verses in, in, this, um, in this chapter are for the latter days, for our time period. And yet, in this very clearly are descriptions of the destruction of Jerusalem that took place in our past. And yet, is there value in reading what the Lord prophesied to the disciples and then watch what we can see happen from history, from the books, from records of Josephus and Eusebius and other early Christian writers or Jewish writers and Christian writers, what is happening during those, yeah. that Jewish war? I, I, think, I think one of the messages here is that um, Jesus is giving um, important information to the church in his day that will provide a temporal salvation, temporal and a spiritual salvation. Mm-hmm. It's going to save their lives. 
And um, I think I think the message is is clear that what he what he said for the for the for the church members in his day um, can also be translated into I'm saying something similar to you in your day, and just as the church, those who were obedient um, to what he gave them earlier. Uh, those that are obedient in the last days will find the same type of temporal and spiritual salvation. Well, let's just look at a couple of examples. As we look at the prophecies um, I, I, of the earlier era, I think down, down through the first phrase of verse 21 of Joseph Smith Matthew. Maybe we should say a word about the organization of the chapter okay. first. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, the introduction uh, comprises of verses 1 through 4. This is setting up what's happened, uh, where the story is going, and the question now that is being asked by the disciples and why they're asking that question. In verse 5, then, you find, uh, you, you begin to get uh, Christ's answer to their two questions that you mentioned earlier, Camille. And I, I, in, in my mind, anyway, uh, his answer, beginning there in verse 5, down through verse 11, is a general statement of conditions that, that prevail in the world, in all times and in all dispensations. Then in verse 12, you begin at a specific uh, and detailed uh, account of what is going to happen to Jerusalem in their day, in the days of the apostles. And then, as you mentioned, beginning uh, around the middle of verse 21, uh, the, the, the scene shifts, and we get him talking, Christ talking about his second coming, which was the other question which mm -hmm. he was asking. When is the second coming? And so from the middle of 21 through the end of, of uh, Matthew, uh, uh, Joseph Smith Matthew, we get statements that concern those latter days, the days that we're living in. And if we want to see, the, in following your train of thought with the organization, if we want to see the bigger picture, what is still part of that sermon, we have Joseph Smith Matthew, which is Matthew 24, but Matthew 25 is the conclusion of the sermon. In many yes. ways, is what yeah. the Lord wants to respond, not simply talking about signs now, but what any time in any um, era when there are challenges, how do we respond? This is now what we should be doing in the meantime, um, which we get in Matthew 25. So those two chapters combined is the, the Olivet Sermon. I think, yes. um, I think what's important, too, is the repetitive nature um, of, of what's happening. Um, what we see happening in, in Jesus' day tends to repeat itself in the last right. days. We see the, the, the term, the abomination of desolation right. used in verse 12 in Jesus' day. We also see a reference of it um, in verse being 32. used in verse 32 in the last days. And thus, I, I think the message is here uh, for uh, his time period and our time period they're really the same in terms right. of how we're to survive. These, some of the, some uh, of the events times. are going to be parallel, but I, I also think that <clears throat> the changes that Joseph made in here, the, the, the new part of this in the Joseph Smith uh, translation of, the, of Matthew 24, teach us that some things aren't going to be the same either. For instance, in verse 18, uh, talking about the destruction that's going to come on, upon Jerusalem in the days of the disciples mm -hmm. around 70 A.D., and again in 132 A.D., I don't think we can exclude that as part of the prophecy either. Mark when Copa. Jerusalem again was totally destroyed, right. this time the, the city was plowed under and no, no Jews were allowed to live there for a number right. of, uh, of centuries. But there in verse 18, the, the destructions will come, for then in those days shall be the tribulation upon the Jews and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, such as was not before sent upon Israel. This will be worse Mm -hmm. than what the Assyrians did, and much worse than what the Babylonians did to, to Jerusalem. But notice what Joseph adds then to that. Uh, no, nor ever shall be sent again upon Israel. The destruction of Jerusalem that's prophesied here will not come on Israel again. And I think that's an important point to make about the kingdom in the mm -hmm. latter days. Let's, let's just see what lesson from the early Christians from that. Where were the Christians? when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. You notice up in these verses up above there, verses 13 through 16, you're talk, or 17, we're, we are seeing some specific direction that the Lord gives. When these signs begin, this is what you should do. What do we know from history about the Christians during that time? 
large population, at least to begin with, were living in Jerusalem. Savior's warning the church uh, about uh, future events. Um, we've referred to the destruction of the Jerusalem at the hands of the Romans in 70 AD and again in 132 AD. But the Savior is, is telling the church, um, look, um, in verse 12, when you see the abomination of desolation, I think it's a clear reference to um, the legions of Rome that are now set upon Jerusalem to destroy it. The Savior's counsel to, to church members is, uh, is very tell. clear. Yeah. It's, Get out. It's yes. Don't stay in Jerusalem. And, and we have some Christian traditions, <clears throat> uh, historical traditions, which tell us that the, the members of the church in those days were told, specifically by their leaders, to leave Judea. And they went, most of them went to a city across the Jordan River called Pella. And there they were safe from the devastations which, yeah. which yeah. struck w Jerusalem. Where do you think their leaders got that direction? That's... It's got to be here. And what do we then learn from those early Christian leaders? They were protected. They were saved because they heeded that warning. Is I'd that like a message? Is that a message for what's coming up sure. here? Well, I'd like to think that they were warned by their home teachers to yeah, get rid of that's Even better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> even better. Well, if we see that example and see how clearly the, the warnings were given and the signs were given and the way history bears that out, we now look to a future event or events and wonder why would it be any different than what we've seen from this previous example. Um, verse 21 to the end of the chapter. 21 is that pivotal verse too, yes. Camille. Uh, uh, everyone ought to realize that, that that brings so much clarity to Matthew 24 to interject 21 in our Joseph Smith Matthew right back into Matthew 24 uh, verse 22 because that's right and, and the prophet adds after these things, and, and so he, he clearly delineates those two time periods there. So here's now the second question. Tell us about his return, his second coming. And, and um, I'd like to begin our discussion on this part of it with verse 23, which I think is a marvelous reminder of why he is doing this. One, he's answering their question. He, they have asked, and he's answering their question. But he tells us he's going to give you signs. He's going to tell us signs of his second coming not to frighten us into repentance, not to give us some ideas so that we can calculate when he's going to come and figure out how much time we have to repent. He says specifically, I'm telling this unto you for the elect's sake, that you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that ye be not troubled. There's a calming feeling just as you read this. This should not make us fearful, but to recognize the Lord is in control. I like what President Hinckley said when he... he um he, he said, I, I don't know what's going to happen down the road here, but uh, there was an encouragement to have a year's supply of food. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. He said, no, I'm not suggesting you run out and panic buying. Remember, don't mm -hmm. go out and rush the supermarket. So. Yes. And that's, that's what the Savior's saying here. Mm -hmm. don't, let's not get into a panic mode here and but rush the supermarket. But it means listening and heeding yeah, what he says. Yeah. And, and I think it's interesting that this verse 23 in, in our Pearl of Great Price here is actually verse 6 in, in Matthew 24. So it, it's, it's, it's moved inverted. its position. It's been inverted. So this is talking about the latter days here, not the, right. not the former days. And, and notice, what, notice what he leads off with in this latter days, or at least one mm -hmm. of the first ones, wars and rumors of wars. Mm -hmm. That phrase, rumors of wars, just has to kind of uh, start your thinking, really going about how, do, has there ever been a people that have lived in a time when not just war, but rumors of wars? Mm -hmm. I mean, our, our newscasts and things, uh, I, I picked up a, a little uh, piece the other day that said they were trying to track it, over 47 armed conflicts this last year, not just skirmishes, but armed conflicts. We really do live in a time of rumors of war. Yep. You know? Now, everybody's lived in times of war, but, but this is truly the time of yeah. rumors of war. I think, too, let's look with that, then, in these signs, they're not all negative doomsday destruction. Mm -hmm. oh. I, I think one of the most fascinating one to me is verse 31. This is one of those that says, again, that, that is not only telling us something for the future, but that suggests this was also part of circumstances and the days of the, the disciples, which I don't think we have a whole lot of detail on. But again, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. I mean, when does that say that the gospel was preached to all the world in an earlier era, and now in the last days it will be preached again? 
that is an opportunity and a responsibility that the elect, those who hearken to his voice and harden not their hearts, have as we look forward to the time of Christ's second coming. It really ties in with um, <clears throat> verse 27. Camille, you, you referred to verse 31. And uh, verse 27, he says, uh, let me show you a parable. Behold, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles mm -hmm. be gathered together. It's sort of a um, roadkill carcass. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in Palestine, the Middle East, um, you, you have the carry-on, if you will. They call them eagles. They're, they're more like vultures. And um, they, they just, uh, especially up in, in the Galilee, the, that area, they'll, they'll fly around and they'll look for anything that's dead. And when, where they find it, they're there, uh, they're there scavenging. So and, what does uh, this mean in this, in this prophecy, in this, these signs? Well, I, th I think uh, symbolically uh, the carcass are those who are to be gathered, uh, potential converts, and the eagles are the, are the Latter-day missionaries. And, and, and um, as surely as you're going to have wars and rumors of wars, we're going to have missionaries that will right. be gathering uh, those out of the world and doing missionary work. That's it. And as a lead into that thought about the missionary work is verse 25, which is, uh, excuse me, verse 26, which is slightly different than mm -hmm. it is in Matthew. And I think there's an important difference. For as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, the people misread the King James English in Matthew where it says lightning mm. of, uh, out of the east. Mm. What it really means is lightening out of the east in, in the King James Bible. Here we have, have the correct way of reading it in our, our Joseph Smith Matthew. For as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, that is, just as the sun comes up and brings light and truth to the world, so will the gospel in the latter days yeah rise up out of the east and bring the gospel light to the whole world and shineth even unto the west. Right. It will cover the whole earth. And so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, over in, in your Doctrine and Covenants, section 45, verse 36, I think it's commenting on this very phenomenon. And when the light shall begin to break forth, it shall be with them like unto a parable, which I will show unto you. And then he gives the parable of the fig tree again in... Uh, in Doctrine and Covenants section 45, it's talking about the gospel is going to come forth in the latter right. days. Which, which, verse 37, which again is one of those positives that calms us down and yeah. helps us see perspective. Whoso treasureth up my word shall not be deceived. For the Son of Man shall come and he shall send his angels before him with the great sound of a trumpet. Not taken as a thief in the, in the night. No. But, but there is, as in the same way you can see that light coming from the east, he will come and you know where to look. You watch as he tells us to in verse 46. Well, it's interesting to note while you're on that verse 37 that that first uh, uh, phrase there has been, uh, is not in Matthew. Right. It's here in our Joseph Smith Matthew that you shall not be, be deceived for yeah. the Son of Man shall come like the light from the east. But, Go on. But, but that requires watching, looking yes. to the east. Yes. As, as verse 36 says, I say unto all men, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord cometh. But yes. we watch, have our eyes on the prophet, um, well, the scripture. Yes. And, and I love the description that he gives of those that watch uh, in, the, in the verse, where is it? Um, uh, who then is a wise and faithful servant? Uh, uh, verse 49 of our Joseph Smith Matthew text. Um, he, he then keys, starts to key in on this word wise. Mm -hmm. And those that are preparing, they are the ones that have this description of wise. Uh, I think that's an excellent point. And um, have you noticed in, in verse 11, I want to come back and talk about what you just said, Keith, but notice the difference in the counsel to the Jews in his day versus the counsel to us in the latter days. To them, in verse 11, it was to remain steadfast and not to be overcome. I, I think it's an, a notion here that... Uh, uh, you're going to see some dreadful things, mm -hmm. terrible things. Such as never were before. never happened mm -hmm. before. And, and I want you to be steadfast. Um, that, that word in mm -hmm. Greek suggests seated, fixed, firm. Right. You, you hang in there and, and remember this counsel. Our counsel is a little bit different. We're not going to have that terrible destruction that they had. We will have destruction. It, uh, we, we believe and there will be yeah. wars and rumors of wars, yeah. and not all the saints will famines, will, pestilence, may come earthquakes, through unscathed. Mm -hmm. We'll have all kinds of trouble, but not like it was then. Ours is going to be a bit different. Yes, for us, 
we're going to need to treasure up the Word. It's, it's, it's God's Word. That's what's going to be our salvation in the last days. It's what he said to us, as you pointed out, Camille. The so what's his the prophets key there? And apostles. So as we look forward into chapter 25, it's having oil in the lamp, which is the very same thing. Yes. What, do our current, what does our current prophet tell us? Uh, in 1997, President Hinckley said this up at a conference at Utah State, a fireside. How do you prepare for the second coming? Well, you just do not worry about it. Sounds like he's kind of blowing it off, right? No. You just live the kind of life that if the second coming were to be tomorrow, you would be ready. I think that's a real capstone for Matthew 24. For more information on this program, visit our website at broadcasting.byu.edu. This program was made possible by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.